So I've been getting some comments about how to start flexible seating. And um, this is what I have to say about it. Now, when I first started flexible seating, I did not watch any YouTube videos. Back then, I think it was like five or six years ago, I don't even think there were any videos at all on YouTube about flexible seating anyway. So uh, I didn't watch any, I just figured it out on my own, pretty much. So I think that that would probably be my first bit of advice. I would advise you turn off this video and figure it out on your own. However, if you do want a few tips and suggestions on what has worked well for me, then you can keep watching and, and I'll give you some more information about what has worked in this classroom. So right now it's summer and I and I have to move all my furniture back to where it originally goes because I put it over on the side so that they could clean the carpets and then they got moved back to clean the tiles and so now I'm back. It's the middle of July and, and I'm setting up my tables for where they go. Now, if you've already watched my classroom tour video, you know that I have many different types of tables and different seating at each table. And if I was watching that for the first time, I would probably be overwhelmed thinking, wow, if I want to do flexible seating, is that the way it should look, you know, the first day that I start it? And the answer is no, definitely not. That's not how I've started it. When I started flexible seating about five years ago, I just started with little bits at a time. So my first tip is start a little bit at a time. When I first started, I didn't have yoga balls, I didn't have low tables, I just had a bunch of desks in rows, and that's it. And I did not like desks in rows, and I needed to change something, and I talked about those reasons for why I wanted to change it in my classroom tour video, so go check that out if you haven't. But basically, I wanted to switch it up, I liked the idea of flexible seating, so I decided to just change one little thing at a time. So the first thing that I did was I took all of my desks and I put them into table groups. And I already had one table in my classroom that I wanted to swap out a few desks for. So I asked my principal, is there a place that I could put these four extra desks? And he said, yeah, there's a little bit of storage space. So he said that I could put those four desks into storage and I used a table for that one table group. And that was pretty much it. That's how I started flexible seating. I just started with one table. And then what I did is, you know, a few months later, I tried moving a couple desks to the back of the room, you know, for the kids that wanted to kind of be a little bit more solitary. And I just changed little bits here and there um, the way that I wanted to, that I felt like it was the best for my students. Here's something else that I did is I had this cart and I had my document camera on it. Uh, it used to always be at the front of the room when I was doing a lesson and instead of this taking up space at the front of the room I just decided to put my document camera on my teacher desk instead and this can be repurposed for my students. So I thought, oh hey, this is the perfect size for a fifth grader for a standing table. And it's on wheels so uh, we can easily move it around if we need to. But you know, we just put a student's name tag right here and then it would be like a personal standing table. So what I did is I used what I already had and I was creative and I thought about what I could use it for something else. And this was the big table that I had in my room at the beginning of when I started teaching here. And I absolutely love this table. It is so sturdy and durable and a lot of students can fit around it. So it's great for group work and, and projects and stuff. But this thing, when I first came to this classroom, was sitting on the side, on the wall, and just had a few shelves on it. So I just decided to pull it away from the wall and use it instead. And I think it's just who I am. I like, to, I like the idea of repurposing things. So I actually got this table from my friends and uh, I thought that it would be a good table to use in the classroom because since it's a dining room table, uh, me personally, I really like doing projects and paperwork and whatever I'm working on at home, I like doing it at the dining room table. So I, 
because that's something that I would appreciate. I brought it in here and some students like working at it, some don't, but you know, that's the idea of flexible seating. Here's another table that I brought from home. This is a round table that I've had since before I got married. And this is just like a little round breakfast table and it fits students nicely. It's nice to have different shapes in the room. So I like the fact that this is the round table and all the other tables are rectangles. So this is a little bit unique and I like that about this table. And it just, this is another one that just reminds me of home. It just kind of gives me that homey feeling, you know? So that's pretty much what I did is, you know, year after year, I would um, ask my principal if there was any more way that they could find space and storage to put my desks. And I shared with him my passion for flexible seating and the fact that I had tables already, you know, he didn't have to buy any for me. He appreciated the fact that I was trying to be unique and innovative and he saw the value in it. And so he was on board with me. I feel like teachers who have administrators that aren't on board and supportive, you're going to have a harder time doing flexible seating. You know, just being honest there. Sometimes there's just going to be limits. And in that case, you might just do simple things. The first couple of years that I did it, I also started with these. So these wobble cushions are something that you can just put on normal chairs. And that is a little, and so that's another option for students who want something that is a little bit different that, that isn't so expensive. And you know, if you don't have a supportive administration, then you know, that might be a better alternative. So if you can't switch out your tables and you're stuck with desks, another idea is just finding stuff here and there. This swivel cozy chair is something that I just found. You know, somebody in my school didn't want it. It said free on it, so I just took it. Uh, here's another one. This said free on it. This one I found down the hall. This one I found down the hall, it said free. This is an awesome chair that is not comfortable at all, but it's fun and the kids like sitting on it because it's fun. Um, and that was free, I got. Uh, these two are new from this summer. These two were give, being given away and I thought maybe I could use these. Maybe I will use them, maybe I won't, I don't know, but I'm gonna you know, try them out and see how it goes and then decide from there. I think one of the big things when you're starting out is to just try it and see how it goes and be willing to fail because there's lots of stuff that I tried in the beginning that failed and so I reworked it and tried it and it didn't go the way that I planned so I tried something else. Something else that came to my mind that it's a good thing to think about is sometimes it's good to ask the students what they prefer. Um, what, I, what I did with the standing table, not this standing table, I actually started with a plastic foldable table and some of the students just said, oh yeah, I'd love to stand, Mr. Riedel. And so I got a plastic table from downstairs that was multi-purpose. And so I tried that out for a couple weeks to see how the students liked it and they really loved it. So I used, so I used that as an idea and I already had this table in my classroom. So what I did is I made this into a standing table. And the nice thing about this is that I didn't actually damage, I didn't drill into the table as it is. I just added legs to it in order to raise it up. I've seen some people just add blocks to the bottom of their table. So it lifts it up so that it's a standing table. So something like that can be done um, with not a whole lot of effort and no damage to the table too. Um, these I put PVC pipe and I made another video right here. You could watch that of how I made this. But if I were to leave and they, and they didn't want to use this as a standing table anymore, then they just pull off the legs and then lower it and it'd be back to normal. So thinking about ways to be creative with what you have and also it doesn't do any damage to the property, that's something to think about too. All right, so all that was to say that small changes little bit by little bit for me it took like five years to get everything the way that i wanted you know a little tinkering here a little adjusting there and it took a long time it's an endurance race at least it was in my situation to be honest i think i kind of lucked out when i was able to get all of my student desks into storage 
I don't think that that happens very often. So if you're thinking that it's easy to get that done, then it might not be. It really all depends on your school and in your school district. Some of you may have noticed that all of my Pez dispensers are missing from my classroom walls. And that's because I took them all down. Stay tuned to another vlog on that one. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about is right here. This is my flexible seating guidelines. I got several questions on how to roll this out to the students. When I first made small changes here and there, I actually implemented it mid-year. The main reason for that is because I wanted to see what students thought about it. I had my classroom procedures and setup at the beginning of the year and then, and then I introduced mid-year something new to the students and then they could give me feedback on whether or not they like it um, or don't like it compared to what the class was like before. So that's one benefit of starting something mid-year. But the last couple years I already had most of this the way that I liked it and it was pretty much all set ready to go. So how do I roll it out to the students at the beginning of the year? So what I do is I talk to the students at the beginning of the year, the first day, and I tell them what are the expectations for each of the different types of seating. The students really come up with the ideas of what they think is appropriate or not, but because they haven't really practiced being on the yoga balls or being at the standing table, they don't really know everything that goes into being at a standing table or on a yoga ball or wobble cushion. So I help complete the list of all the guidelines. So we come up with all these rules for the yoga balls. It says keep feet on the floor, no bouncing like a basketball. You know, they do that. They like to bounce it. Uh, keep your butt on the ball, no sharp objects touching the ball, put the ball on the orange disc when not in use, stuff like that. So all the different expectations for each of the different tables that is what is expected of them. And I have them sign their name right here. It's hard to see that, but you can see there's a bunch of signatures. All of them agree to what the guidelines are for how we are going to behave when we use these items. So they all agree to that, and then they sign their name, and basically I say, okay, from now on, since you signed your name, you agree to, if you're not following those guidelines, then I will remove that seat from you. A big one is the yoga ball. I will remove the yoga ball from you if you're not behaving properly on it, and you will have to stand or sit on the floor. Uh, basically, they get the privilege taken away from them for the day and then they get it again tomorrow and if it becomes a habit then they just don't get it for the rest of the week but usually they're pretty good about following the rules as long as i make sure to enforce the consequence if i don't enforce the consequence if i if i choose to ignore what they're doing or if i don't notice it you know then the, these guidelines don't matter at all it, as long as i'm enforcing it that and keeping con and being consistent with it then that's what's going to get them to follow the guidelines I would just do it the same way. If I introduce something mid-year, then we just talk about it when I first bring it in. And I talk to the students and they talk about what their ex the expectations should be. And sometimes I think of something new a few weeks later and I just say, okay, new rule. You know, when the time comes, when you realize that the students aren't behaving a certain way, then what I do is I talk to them about it. We have a classroom discussion and we all come to an agreement on what should be expected. So, and then we just move forward from there. You're not gonna be able to lay out all the rules at the b very beginning and expect that it to goes perfectly throughout the whole year. You know, you're gonna have obstacles and you're gonna have adjustments throughout the year as you go along. Um, some things are gonna work, some things aren't going to work and you know, you just have to kinda adjust it on the fly. <clears throat> but in regards to the first week, our school starts after Labor Day. So the day after Labor Day, that's Tuesday, we usually have an open house. And so I usually put their name tags just randomly um, anywhere on random tables. And so they find their name and they put their school supplies down and then they introduce me. Anyway, they, it's just more of an open house greeting kind of thing and then that's it and, and then they leave. But the first day of school is the Wednesday after Labor Day and they actually come in the morning and it's like an actual school day and their name tags are at the same spot so they know where their spot is going to be and so they are at that spot for the whole first day. Then the second day, that Thursday, uh, I usually move their name tags at the, that morning to a different spot and so they try out a different table. And then the next day, they try out a different table. So I kind of mix it around that first week so they kind of get a little bit of a taste of sitting in different locations. Um, and then that Friday afternoon is the first time that we have a classroom meeting and we get 
to decide where we sit. The students get to decide where they sit. Uh, some teachers, what they do is they just draw popsicle sticks, and I used to do that. However, I wanted a little bit more, more control, so I created a strategically randomized sheet where I knew what the order was going to be, but it still was pretty much random. Um, anyway, I just it just helped me to know what was coming uh, rather than just pulling sticks. So at the end of every Friday, we have a classroom meeting. At the end of the meeting, uh, the students get to pick where they sit. You know, one at a time, I call their name, they go um, move their name tag to a different spot, a different table, and then they come and sit back down. That's pretty much it. Uh, I don't expect you to do exactly the same way that I do it. I've actually kind of changed that system very different. I used to have all the kids line up in the back of the room and then they pick spots, but I found that it kind of works better for them to be sitting on the floor so they don't see as very much. They really want to talk to their friends about where they're going to Oh, that leads me to the next thing that I wanted to talk about. And that was, how do I make sure that they pick the spot that is best for them as a learner and not just sitting next to their friends. Hmm. I wish I had a good answer for that question, but I don't. I would love it if it was a perfect world and all of my students really wanted to be good learners and they really wanted to sit in the spot where they would learn the best, but it's not a perfect world and most of my students just want to sit next to their friends. That's definitely something that I'm still working on. Um, sometimes what I do, if I think that they're being like too clicky or you know sitting with their friends and not you know expanding their horizons, sometimes what I do is I am the one who makes the seating chart. So I kind of take their privilege away and I say, all right, this week I'm going to be picking your spots. So you just lost privilege. I will still randomly select names, but based on what I know about you, I will select the spot that I think is best for you. So sometimes that kind of wakes them up and makes them realize, oh, well, it's not all up to us. You know, he still is the teacher and he still gets to choose where we sit ultimately. That's something that I think is a good wake up call to them that it is a privilege to get to pick where you sit and that this is something that I'm doing out of the kindness of my heart and because I think it will be better for certain people. And so I give them kind of a lecture, I kind of talk to them, we have a classroom discussion about why some people learn better when they're standing and some people learn better when they're at a, a wobble stool and some people learn better when they are sitting on the floor and some people just on a plastic chair. Different people have different spots where they learn best and it's important to help the students remind them about that because oftentimes they forget and all they focus on is who they're sitting next to rather than rather than why someone would learn better in a certain spot. And then once I feel like after maybe a week or two they've kind of got the point then I let them choose seats again and um, then it's their choice again. Um, and sometimes what I do is maybe two or three kids are being like exclusive to certain kids. Like maybe they're, it's not the whole class that has a problem, but just one or two or three kids. And so what I do is for them, I just say, well, you guys were being exclusive. You guys were not working as a team. You guys were, you guys weren't following the rules about being respectful to everyone. So you are not going to get to pick your seat. So instead I just pick their seat for those few students. And so they just sit on the carpet with everybody else and I just move their name tag to where I feel like they would learn best. And usually it's away from each other. So sometimes I have talks with the whole class, sometimes I just have talks with individual students. Um, it really depends on what the atmosphere is like, what the culture is like in your classroom at, at a particular time during the school year. We all know that the beginning of the school year, they're all in their best behavior, but you know, as the months go on, um, you get to know them better, they loosen up more, so things change as the months go on. Something else that I do that is kind of a mixture between the two is not always just me picking their seats, and it's not always just them picking their seats, but sometimes what I do is I put on the projector and I say, write on this little piece of paper, what are your top three choices for where you want to sit? I read an article last year about a teacher who, what she did was every Friday, she had all the students write on a little piece of paper 
one student that they thought was an exceptional classroom citizen and like three people that they wanted to sit next to the following week and she said it really helped her figure out who the students were that were isolated and ignored and um, I think this was a response to what happened with the school shooting and um, it really helped her identify who those students were that were kind of like outcasts and who didn't have friends and and that really helped her gauge uh, who in the class needed to sit in a group that would be kind to them and something like that. Um, so anyway, what I've done in the past is sometimes I kind of do a hybrid and I put options on the classroom board at the end of the Friday and I say, okay, name someone who you think is an exceptional classroom citizen from that following week and name a few people that you want to sit next to and name a couple tables that you want to sit at, like what's the flexible seating choice that you would prefer. And I actually got some really interesting thoughts from that because they weren't just focused on their friends, they also wrote down the fact that, you know, I prefer to be at a standing table or I really don't like sitting on the floor or I don't want to sit in the single tables, I would rather be in a group, you know, stuff like that. And it helped give me an idea of who my students were and and what they preferred and what they didn't like and stuff like that. And so that's something else that I do from time to time. Also, the last thing that I wanted to mention had to do with how I manage it throughout the day. So usually what I do is I have this up on the board and I mentioned this in the classroom tour video. So it says seating here and I have some other stuff here. So the students see this all throughout the day. You know, it's front and center, well not front and side. <laughs> so this is an indicator that tells the students what I prefer for where they are sitting at a particular time throughout the day. If I prefer their assigned seats, so like if Johnny's here and Susie's here and Sally's over there, uh, because that's where their name tag is at, then that's where I expect them to sit when it says assigned. If I move it to anywhere, then that gives them the choice and the freedom to go anywhere that they want. For example, sometimes students get tired standing all day. So oftentimes, like during work time, I put the indicator on anywhere so they can choose to sit like against the wall, on the floor if they want, or they can grab an extra chair from my stack that's usually over here. I usually have this stack of three chairs over here. So some of them might prefer to grab one of those. Um, sometimes the students want to sit over underneath the window, so they like sitting against the wall over there. Maybe a student is absent one day and they uh, want to sit here because a student is absent, then they could do that. But only when it's uh, indicated by anywhere. Uh, if I switch it back to assigned seats, then they all go back to the seats that are assigned to them and then that is where they go. So this is really helpful when I'm t like teaching a lesson or something and I just want them all spread out evenly around the room Then I put them in their assigned seats. Uh, but if it's like work time and I don't really care where they're at or where they're, who they're sitting next to as long as they're on task and focused, then they can sit anywhere that they want. So this is adds to the flexible seating aspect of it. Not only is it flexible seating because they get to choose where they want every Friday, but it's also flexible in the sense that they could ideally sit anywhere that they want um, when I tell them that it's okay. And at the beginning of the year, I just roll this out to them by explaining to them the difference, just like, just like I explained to you. And then we do a little bit of role play. Like on the floor here, I ask a couple of students to demonstrate what would be okay or not okay. And you know, if they're like laying on their back with their feet against the wall or something, obviously that's not okay. So, and then we demonstrate what the proper way is to pick a seat and choose a spot working hard and working on task at a particular spot. So, that's pretty much it. Um, I can't think of anything else to talk about. So, that was just a quick little video on how I implement flexible seating in my classroom. But, you know, again, like I said at the beginning of the year, it is really best if you figure out how to do it yourself in your own classroom. You're not gonna be able to copy what I do in my classroom because you have a different group of students, you have different uh, culture, 
you have different furniture, you know, it's never going to be the same. Even my own classroom changes year to year because I get different students. So what works for some teachers and some students definitely does not work for other teachers and other students. So I really encourage you, if you are starting flexible seating, to figure it out on your own. Try little changes at a time. Don't try to change the whole classroom all at once. Even if you have a million dollars to spend on a whole new classroom with all new furniture, I still wouldn't recommend it. I would still recommend changing little bits at a time because of the fact that huge adjustments like that are really difficult to do. Not just for the students, but it's difficult for you as a teacher. So changing little bits at a time allows you to focus on one little thing at a time. Uh, at least for me, that would be really hard to do. Maybe for you it's different, but like I said, figure it out on your own, what works best for you, and uh, don't be afraid to fail because I've failed lots of times. I've messed up with table groups and, and I have created a lot of these rules because I messed up and that helps ingrain it in my mind what I should do next time because I made that mistake. You know, just like the students are learning day to day, you know, teachers can learn too. And that's an important way to get it ingrained in your head is to make mistakes and learn from them. So I encourage you teachers, if you want to do this, make mistakes, please, and figure it out on your own. That's all I have. If you have questions on anything that I missed or additional questions on things that I didn't cover, please feel free to leave a question below, and I would be happy to get back to you and let you know how my experience was. But, you know, again, it's what happened to me. Try things for yourself and see how they go. Feel free to let me know how they go. If you tried something and it works really well, let me know and I'd love to hear about it. So thanks for watching. Talk to you guys later.